Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Stacy Jividen as she discusses strategies for practicing ergonomic dentistry. At any point during the webinar, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll get a reply to you via email within two business days. And lastly, Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation, live or on demand. Now, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jividen. Hey, everybody. This is Dr. Stacey Jividen coming at you from Hamilton, Montana. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Henry Schein, for this opportunity to talk about ergonomics in dentistry. And so what I'm going to be discussing is not only ergonomics and dentistry, but everything that is encompassing that concept inside out the, and outside of the office and how what we do in the office can actually have an impact on what we do outside of the office. So our learning objectives for today are very broad. Uh, we're going to be talking about why we should even be concerned about dental ergonomics. Uh, we're going to talk about muscular skeletal disorders as a result of poor um, ergonomics. We will also go over risk factors, signs and symptoms and how to assess your personal situation. Um, with that, we also will uh, go over intervention and in how to combat MSDs. Uh, dental equipment and the armamentarium that assists you to have better uh, posture and ergonomics while you're working, how to reduce the stress and strain um, outside the dental setting, um, and why you should encourage your staff to maintain healthy ergonomic practices. First of all, I think we need to actually define what ergonomics is. In Greek, Ergo means work and nomino means the natural laws or systems. And so ergonomics is basically an applied science that's concerned with designing procedures for maximum efficiency and safety. So ergonomics basically modifies the tasks to meet the needs of the people instead of the other way around. And that is something that we can really apply in dentistry. And we'll get more into that later on. I think this slide kind of gives a good broad overview of the concepts regarding ergonomics and dentistry falls into almost every single one of these categories. It involves equipment positioning. It entails storage accessibility. And this goes into some slides I'll be talking about later on where you keep your things. When you're in the chair, do you have to turn to grab things, et cetera? Your stools, your chairs, uh, for you, your assistants, hygienists, et cetera, and even your front desk. Um, maybe a little bit of cultural expectations in dentistry, not so much there, but also adjusting chair heights, your monitors and glare and lighting, um, task repetitiveness, uh, reducing discomfort with what you're doing, and supporting correct posture. I like the picture in this slide because I think it gives a good image of what muscular skeletal disorders entail. It is uncomfortable, it is painful, and it can actually put you into retirement a lot earlier than you think. Um, recent statistics indicate that 29 and up to 55% of dentists are forced into early retirement because of muscular skeletal disorders. That's a lot. You may anticipate practicing up to 30 years, but because of MSDs, that may be cut short. Why should this be a big deal? Why do we even care about it? Why should we talk about it? Interestingly enough, um, even after the implementation of four-handed dentistry and ergonomic equipment, studies have shown that 81% of dental operators have pain in the back, neck, shoulders, wrists, arms, and hands, 81%. Chances are that if you are watching this webinar, you are probably in that 81%. If you're not, then I congratulate you because you are doing something right. 60,000 hours, that's about how much time we spend in the dental chair over the course of our careers. That's a lot of hours. That's a lot of awkward positioning or the potential for awkward positioning. 
Um, and so when you combine all of that, it actually can have a pretty severe impact on what you do or don't do subsequently in the chair later on your, in your career and then also outside the office. If these issues aren't addressed later on or early on, the cumulative effect has the potential to impact your personal life and professional life. And there's a balance um, as indicated in for the picture. You have your work, your life, and your health. If any of those are not in sync, then things are not going to play out well in your favor. Why are these numbers so staggering? I mean, you would think that as healthcare providers, we should practice what we preach, right? But interestingly enough, most practitioners have the knowledge to implement proper ergonomics, but we don't apply it. There's uh, basically just a, a kind of get in your rut type of thing. We just get in, do what we need to do and get out. And we don't give thought to habits that develop over a period of time. We don't have good application to this knowledge and bad habits and routines. And guess what? We get back pain, we get neck pain, we get shoulder pain, we get MSDs, and we start talking about early retirement. This can get expensive, really expensive. We have to go to the doctor. We have to go to the chiropractor. We have to go see the physical therapist and the massage therapist. That is time away from our chair. It is time away from our families. It is uh, expensive and it can actually be an exponential cost over a period of time. If we can't work um, or work efficiently, then we sometimes have to increase our chair time to do certain procedures. If your back hurts and you're having to stop constantly because you can't do what you need to do, it's going to take longer to do that procedure. Time and chair, time and money are hand in hand when you're sitting in the chair. You don't perform well. You do uh, restorative work that is not to the level that, that you have the potential to uh, put it at. And sometimes you have to do redos because you are unable to get the right angulation or uh, be efficient in the procedures that you're doing. And that is expensive over a period of time. Not to mention your quality of life. You have limitations on activities and you know inside your practice, obviously, but then outside. You know, what you're doing or what you're not doing inside your, your practice has an, has an impact on activities outside. You have to go see the doctor more. That doesn't sound like fun. I don't know about you, but I would much rather be riding my bike than going to a doctor. Um, spiraling of health. You have to have a surgery because you have carpal tunnel or a herniated disc. You have to be put on medications for chronic pain or inflammation. Uh, uh, psychological and mental wellness. Um, you know, you get depressed because you can't do anything with your family and that can have an impact on your uh, mental capacity. And that in turn will have an impact on how you work in your relationships with your friends and family. Interestingly enough, I had a situation that I dealt with not too long ago. It wasn't specific with what I had been doing in the dental office, but it kind of drives home the point of how being not in the right alignment, if you will, um, kind of stopped me in my tracks. I had woke up one morning and my neck felt a little bit off and I didn't think much of it. I went to work and it started to hurt more. And eventually it got to the point where I, and this was over the course of about two weeks and I couldn't move at all. And so I got up and I called my girls and I said, I can't come in today. It hurts too bad. I went to the physical therapist. I went to the chiropractor over the course of the next week and a half. And I was finally able to get to a point where I could function. If I am not in the chair, things aren't happening um, from uh, a lot of aspects. Productions being lost, 
money is being lost, uh, patients aren't being seen, the work stacks up, uh, overhead is still ticking away, and all these things start piling on. And so I was really focused on trying to get better so I could get back in and start working again. And that was just one small episode. Imagine if this is chronic. Imagine if you're having to call in two or three times over the course of a few month period, it adds up quickly. So you basically have two options. You can be the person on the left hand of the screen or you can be on the right hand of the screen. You can live or you can exist. And what you do in the dental practice and when, when you're sitting and working on patients and how your ergonomic principles are applied patient to patient will decide to some way, shape or form whether you live or exist. So let's go back to the basics. If you understand anatomy and ergonomic principles, you can have better personal day-to-day -day and long-term adaptation. But let's break it down even further. If you are one of those people that knows that your ergonomics is really lacking or you know it could see some improvement, let's start with this 30-minute occlusal filling appointment that you have coming up. Start with that. And then go to the next appointment that might be 45 minutes long. And then you can focus on day-to-day -day and build into a long-term adaptation. So when you look at the spine, because the spine is really the epicenter of a lot of where the ergonomic principles come from. You have four natural uh, curves to the spine. You have the cervical, which is more the head and neck area, the thoracic, uh, which is upper back, the lumbar, lower back, and then the pelvic area. When these curves are present, balanced, and at the center of gravity, the spine is supported by the bony structures resting on top of each other. So the head is naturally positioned over the pelvis, is depicted by the blue line from basically head to hip. That is the ideal position an anatomically correct position for posture. What are some benefits of proper posture? Well, you have maximum absorption of stress from day-to-day -day activities. Our body has inherent protective mechanisms within it to absorb stresses and strains and things that get imposed upon it. When we are in proper alignment, these joints and muscles are utilized to their maximum efficiency. And when we are doing the two uh, top boxes, then we naturally prevent the uh, degenerative process of aging because our body is able to function as it should. Posture, let's define posture, is basically how you hold or don't hold your body. And it has an impact on the short and long-term consequences. There are good, and bad postures. Um, if you are not in proper alignment, then you get flattened or exaggerated curves in your spine. And a common consequences of this is that you have increased independence and use of muscles and ligaments and soft tissue in ways that they're not intended. Things get stretched and strengthened when they're not supposed to be. And then you get muscle memory and then you get inflammation and it spirals from there. We'll touch on this a little bit more later on. There are two types of posture. One is static posture. And that's the one that we deal with primarily on a day-to-day -day basis in dentistry. It's the position of the body and how it's held when we are not in motion, when we are sitting still like I'm doing now. When we're sleeping, we're standing, we're sitting at the dental chair. When we have a handpiece in our hand, a mirror, how our body is positioned. When we have dynamic posture, we are obviously moving, walking, running, et cetera. When we are in a static posture position as dentists with the positions that we work in, we assume the, those static postures have about 50% of the body's muscles that are contracted to hold that body motionless in that position for a period of time, 50%. That's a lot. And Somebody had asked me the other day when I was talking about this, they said 50%, no, that's not possible. But when you think about it, it's true. 
your feet are on the ground and there is pressure placed upon the floor with your feet to maintain balance on your chair. That gets transferred into your hips and your legs and then your lower back, your cervical area up through your shoulders and then your hands have to be in a position, um, your core and that pretty much is close to 50% of your muscles, if not more. Prolonged static posture. It can be a good thing, not really. <laughs> Mostly something that you want to avoid if your posture is improper. So if you are in a position where you are hunched over, what happens? Let's go break, let's break down the, the negatives. Um, you get muscle fatigue and imbalance. Um, and what I mean by that is if you are holding that position for a long period of time, you have muscles that are being stretched and you have muscles that are contracting at the same time. The muscles that are uh, being contracted, they get fatigued. And then over a period of time, there's an imbalance with the strength of one muscle group versus the other. When you have constant uh, positioning of these muscles, um, then you can put yourself in a position where there can be ischemia or necrosis. There, the blood flow is decreased to that area. It can lead to trigger points and muscle substitutions because if a muscle is hurting and it's in pain, the accessory muscles will start to compensate for what's going on. And then we have pain. Nobody likes pain but this is what happens when we are not in a good position that's being held for a long period of time. Then we get protective muscle contraction. Your body protects itself. We see this day to, you know, every day in the clinical setting with dentistry. Um, you know, a tooth will try to protect itself. It tries to, you know, you know for, for example, periodontal disease, when you have an infection uh, and tartar buildup, the bone, pulls away because it's trying to remove itself from that inflammation. Uh, same thing here, you have protected muscle contraction because something's hurting, something's not working, so your body's trying to compensate for it. When you do that, you get joint hypermobility, your joints aren't able to move like they should, you get nerve compression, spinal disc degeneration, and herniation. Things start getting pinched. Things aren't being cushioned like they're supposed to be. And that's when you can get muscular skeletal disorders that will end up putting you in a position that you have to manage it because you can't work anymore. The prominent types of MSDs in the dental profession, most of them are in the lower back, 55 to 90%. There is some in the upper back, um, kind of the, the cervical area, um, more where your trapezius muscles are. Um, and so those are the main areas, your back and then kind of your, your head, neck and upper trapezius areas because of where we have to bend our, our heads and necks. So basically where the uh, inflammation is highlighted in the picture. Let's not forget our other important tools in dentistry that allow us to do our work. That's our hand and wrists. Our colleagues, uh, hygienists, et cetera, this is something that they suffer more from than we do, but we still uh, have tendencies to suffer from issues like tendinitis, trigger finger, carpal tunnel syndrome, et cetera. And so we have to be cognizant of that. And, and some uh, specialties within dentistry, they're more prone to this. Um, endodontists, uh, not so much since the introduction of uh, rotary endodontics, but um, with what we do in the very small space that we work in, um, we are definitely prone to these types of uh, injuries. Risk factors. What is it that we do specifically that um, makes us prone to musculoskeletal disorders? Awkward postures is probably the most prominent one. And I'll touch on that a little bit more in the next slide. But uh, forceful exertions. Um, how forceful are we in doing what we're doing? There is a right way and a wrong way to do it. For example, if you're extracting a tooth, there's a little bit more force that's needed. Um, are you applying that force in the proper way? Repetitive motions. If you do something over and over and over again, again, this is something that hygienists uh, uh, do quite a bit of and uh, 
the, the genesis for a lot of their hand and wrist problems. And the duration of something that you're doing it in. Um, is it short, quick, to the point, or is it something that's going to last for a really long period of time? And if it is, that's when you're, start, you're gonna start to get some muscle fatigue. Uh, contact stresses or pinching positions. Um, and this is something that we touch upon later with uh, instruments, but if the instruments and tools that we're using are ergonomically satisfactory, then these stresses and pinching positions are not as problematic as they would be otherwise. Um, vibrations. Uh, there are some instruments that we use that have a lot of uh, vibrational uh, capacity to them. And if it is significant enough, what happens is we have to grab things long, uh, harder. And we have to grab harder, then there is more muscle uh, exertion and we're prone to fatigue. And let's not forget uh, mental factors. If you're stressed and you bring that into the workplace, you're already tense. And then if you are more tense, on top of that, because of the position that you have to put yourself in, that's going to build and create the potential for uh, issues down the road. I mentioned awkward postures on the last slide, but let's dig into that a little bit um, because no doubt this is probably the biggest genesis for MSDs and what we do as dentists. So when you think about it, when we are in an awkward position. There's a reason why. We have to coordinate positions between us and our assistant. Our assistants have to get in there just like we do. Uh, when they can't get where they need to get so they can help us see and do what we need to do, typically we're the ones that give. If we can't see something in the patient's mouth, then typically, again, we are the ones that have to compensate. We're the ones that have to move around. Not all patients can lay in a supine position or they have to keep their neck turned a certain way. And so when their capacity to be in an ideal position is altered, guess who gets to compensate for it? We do. Um, let's not forget the equipment that we use. Um, sometimes we have so much stuff in our operatories. We've got scanners, we've got um, uh, lasers, we've got things on carts, we've got tables and all these things. Um, and in order to reach around them because there's no place for them, we have to twist and turn and put ourselves in uh, positions that can be considered awkward. So there's a lot of things that we have to do and that we, I would submit, almost willingly do to do what we need to do and to make the work happen, but we're put in a position that, that uh, is, is awkward. Signs and symptoms. I like the slide or the picture here because the signs and symptoms um, are cumulative. They are systemic. They have a impact that is full body. So if you have a decreased range of motion, or loss of normal movement, you could be developing MSDs. If you have fatigue in the shoulders and neck, so you work all day and you come home and the last thing you want to do is move, the only thing that's comfortable is for you to lay down, that's an indication that you may be having really poor posture at work. You lose your coordination. You can't hold your handpiece in your mirror and get to where you need to go, or you might slip uh, with some of the uh, uh, procedures, you know, the handpiece slips out of your mouth, which goes to grip decrease in grip strength, or your hands start to cramp, uh, your fingertips start to tingle, or they burn, or it can travel up the arm and head and neck area. Um, and it's full body. How is it full body? Why would your ankles or your knees or your hips or anything like that be a consideration for MSDs or pain that you're having in the shoulder? Well, if you think about it, your body is connected. If you have a hip injury, you're going to favor the opposite side and your muscles are going to have an impact. Your knees and your ankles, you're going to walk in a different manner. So if you have pain in your shoulders, you might have to twist 
because it's more comfortable that way. When you twist, it has an impact on your hips and your hips are connected to your knees. There's a lot of weight that goes on your knees. And so you walk funny, that impacts your knees and subsequently impacts your ankles. So it has a full body impact. It varies depending on the extent, but it is a full body impact when we start to have MSD some symptoms. Long-term impact clearly is inflammation. When you have inflammation, there are other things that can develop. Um, obviously we're talking about MSDs, but you know, inflammation is a systemic thing. Just because you have pain in your shoulder doesn't mean that it's not going to affect other areas. How do we combat and treat MSDs? Well, it, it is a comprehensive approach. And if you think that, um, you know, sitting straight with your feet on the floor, you know, knees bent, um, proper, you know, if, if you think that's all there is to it, you're wrong. It's, it's very comprehensive. And it's also something that is inside, both inside and outside of the office. I think we have to, again, go back to the body. And I really, really appreciate this picture because it shows the symptom or the this different systems that the body has. You have your skeletal system, which is huge in MSDs. But married on top of that, we have the skeletal or the muscular system. And then you have your vascular system and your nervous system and then all the other systems that, that get put together and our body really works like a machine. And these systems are built upon each other and they're dependent and independent of one another. Our body is designed to move and adapt, to build and change uh, uh, in response to the challenges that we uh, impose on it. But we also have to remember that everybody's body is different. There's different types, there's different strengths, there's different um, ways that we approach things. And some of that is personality based, but some of that is just in general build. And so there's not a one size fits all solution. And so you really have to understand your specific body type and then progressively take it from there. And I think I'm preaching to the choir when I talk about some of these things. Uh, we talked about a functional understanding. You have to have and want a respect for your body. If you don't respect it, then everything else pretty much can, can just go to the wayside. We're talking about diet. Diet is huge. What do you eat during the day? How much do you drink? Do you meal prep? Um, do you eat a lot of sugar? Do you drink 10 cups of coffee? You know, um, all those types of things have a huge impact because it would be like putting really crappy fuel into your car. You know, if you've got a Ferrari, you're not going to be putting 85 octane gas in your car. It's not going to function well. It's just like your body. If you're putting foods in it that are not ideal and healthy, then your body's not going to function right. Same thing with exercise. We're designed to move. Um, exercise encompasses strength in aerobic um, and also stress management. And in this, you know, I put some pictures of some healthy foods. Uh, I am an avid runner, um, but I also look for opportunities to do things with my boys. And, you know, biking is a good exercise that, that I enjoy doing with them. Um, and I also do some kickboxing. And so what you do to keep yourself active can be all over the board. If you're not sure, then experiment and find that niche and then go with it. When you break it all down, and this is kind of huge, it boils down to discipline inside and outside the office. People say, oh, I just need to be motivated. No, it's discipline. If you want to eat well, you have to be disciplined about it. If you want to have good ergonomics while you're sitting in the dental chair, you have to discipline yourself enough to do it. So let's point out some improper posture positions here that are is very, very common in the dental office. And so interestingly enough, I, um, I, I paid close attention to how I did dentistry and then um, went to a few other dental offices and uh, looked at uh, positioning of, of some of my colleagues. In this picture, you have what probably <laughs> more than half of our, our colleagues do. We are slunched over in the chair, we're leaning forward, and the support of the spine is, uh, the posture of the spine is obviously not ideal. 
Um, in this picture here, obviously, um, the uh, provider is hunched over. We can gain better visibility. And when that happens, the vertebrae can't support the spine. You can have the potential to have tension neck syndrome, which gives you headaches, chronic pain in your neck, shoulders, interscapular muscles, arms, trapezius. And you can tell from this picture that this just doesn't look comfortable. How can he sit like that? I've sat like that a long time ago. I tried to, I really tried to uh, modify my posture and I'll touch on that a little bit. And then muscle imbalances. Um, again, your muscles try to compensate for inadequate posture positions. And so muscles that typically don't work in certain positions are called upon to become stronger. And so you get uh, kind of the rounded slumped over, you know, shoulder postures. Um, those are just some of the things that you can see. With regards to the back, you can see that that lumbar spine is unsupported and it's flat. The spine literally hangs on the muscles and ligaments and the soft tissues. Tension and ischemia will result. And then you get risk for herniate, herniation. No bueno. So how are we supposed to sit in the dental chair? So the key to all this is maintaining a low back curve. The chair um, is, is huge and the support that you get from your chair is huge. Uh, most dentists have just your standard operating chair, like what is depicted in this picture. Um, you have your seat and then you have your, your uh, the back of the seat. And ideally you're supposed to be pushed up against the back of the seat and then get the support of the lower lumbar spine. It should be tilted forward. Um, your feet should be flat on the floor. Your hips should be higher than the knees. Um, and your abdominal muscles should contract a little bit to stabilize your low back curves. Core strength is huge. You need to kind of pivot forward from your hips, not so much your waist. Um, and then the ideal position is the 12 o'clock position. But guess what? Most of us are, because we're right-handed, we practice in the 10 o'clock position because it's more comfortable in a way, but the 10 o'clock position gives us more room. Why does it give us more room? Because usually we have something behind us that doesn't allow us to get our chair directly behind the patient in that 12 o'clock position. And so we have to go to the right a little bit or the left if you're left-handed. And so room setup is, is, is something that you have to take into consideration, especially if you're designing. Another thing that a lot of us use are loops angulation of those loops is huge. Um, it allows us to have our patients at an ideal distance because things are magnified. The strength, you know, you can debate about the strength all day long and there's pros and cons with that. But generally speaking, if you have two times the strength, you have enhanced detail, but you have the same field of vision. If you go anything greater than that, your detail is, is significantly increased but your field of vision is decreased. And so depending on what you do will basically give you an indication of the type of loops that, that are best for you. Um, what I see and have seen a lot of times is providers will have loops, but they still have their patients up really high. And so when your patient is too high, you have to bring your shoulders up and you have to bring your arms into this position. And so your loops are like this, and then you start having eye fatigue as well. Uh, interestingly enough, I had a personal situation with my loops that I replaced probably about six or seven years ago. I used my loops from dental school for years and years and years. It's finally time to get a new pair. I got them ordered and I tried them out for about, uh, it was probably about a two week period. And I noticed that my neck really started to hurt. And I, took my loops off and I put my old loops back on and that fatigue went away. And so I called the rep and I told him what my problem was. And he said, we just need to adjust the angulation of your loops. And, you know, keep in mind that, you know, when you're fresh out of dental school, or if you've had the same loops forever and ever and ever, sometimes the angulation, you know, you kind of have an idea of what it should be, but if it's not ideal, you know, 20 degrees or less, um, 
then it can really have an impact in my neck really, really started to hurt. I hate taking ibuprofen, but I was popping it for a few days afterwards before I figured out exactly what was going on. So if you're having neck problems and you feel like you're doing really well in all the other areas of your, your posturing and your seating and everything, maybe it's your loops. Check the angulation of your loops. Patient positioning is, is huge. Um, again, you want to avoid single static postures. So how this provider is positioned on the top picture here, um, you can see that her lower back is up against the uh, uh, rest of the chair. It's tilted forward. Her feet are flat and she is uh, straight in her back. Um, and so that is an ideal position, but even then that can be a static position. Um, if you are doing something that is a little bit longer, but you can't move, maybe just shift your feet a little bit. Um, when you move your feet, your back muscles shift and that can, can help with uh, disrupting that static uh, positioning. Um, positioning your pa the patients to the proper height. Most of us, or it is very, very common for us to place them too high because they're closer to us, we can see what's going on. And so the, the key to that is you want to get your chair and you in the right position. And then you position your patient according to that. And another thing too, that I like to do is uh, alternate between standing and sitting. You know, longer procedures, I will I'll sit, but uh, sometimes when I go do a hygiene exam, I'll stand, or if it's something really quick, I'll stand just for some variation in, in my day-to-day. -day. When we disrupt these static positions, um, a lot of good things happen. The blood flow returns to the muscles. We have an increase in the production of uh, the synovial fluid, and that prevents hypomobility. If we can't move and we've got a job to do, that's a problem. Um, and when that happens, we can maintain our normal range of motion. We get an increase in the nutrient supply to the vertebral discs and the muscles and our hands and wrists. Um, and it creates a relaxation response to the central nervous system. It's like, ah. Oh. I, I got a break. You know, it's, it's like when you're working out, you have to take a break between reps because you have to reset and then you can go again. Um, and it warms up the muscles um, and then you can jump right in. And it also can identify tight structures that might be predisposed to injury. And so if you're having pain and you have to stop to re alleviate that pain, that's an indication that that muscle group is not working like it should or it's being overworked and you need to analyze why and try to fix it. In this video demonstration, I'm really grateful to have uh, Romelo Rodriguez, he's a physical therapist, uh, talk about some stretches and some techniques that we can apply to target uh, problematic muscle groups in dentists and hygienists. And so we're talking about, uh, you know, core muscles and some of the bigger muscle groups. And so he did a video that you can um, take a look at. And these are things that don't require a huge footprint in your dental office. You can do all of these in some way, shape or form in your practice. So take a look. Hi everyone, Romelo Rodriguez here with the Lateral Health Network. Today I'm here to demonstrate for you six exercises that all dentists and hygienists can do to keep their bodies healthy and fit. Um, hopefully this helps you maintain a good posture and to correct some of the imbalances that can happen from dental positions over time, when you're assessing patients or discussing with patients on a stool, when you're treating them and you're slightly twisted over and bent over in a flexed position of the spine. These kinds of positions can put a lot of stress and tension on your low back erectors and on your spinal discs in general. So today, as I'm demonstrating these exercises, I'm going to be mentioning bracing your core quite a bit. And by that, to keep things simple for these six, what I typically mean by that is trying to keep your core in a flex position. The easiest way to visualize that is as if you were about to take some impact to your belly button or stomach. So kind of the reflexive action you would have to brace your core to tighten up so that you can create somewhat of a wall to take that impact. 
that's kind of what I want you to associate with bracing your core for today. And when you think about bracing your core, think about it as if it's a dimmer switch. On a scale of one to 10, you can brace it as hard as you can for lots of impact or brace it at a two out of 10 for a little bit of a brace. And in some positions, it's gonna be easier to hold the two out of 10 brace than it is for the 10 out of 10 brace. And most times that's all you'll need. So the first exercise I'm gonna go through here um, from the article to cover the article is the plank. Now in the plank position, we wanna keep our elbows directly under our shoulders, hips hovering over the floor, and try to be a straight board from your ankles to the, to the base of your, to the crown of your skull. Okay, keep your core brace at about a two out of 10. Hold strong with the brace. And try to start with that for about 20 seconds and keep progressing every time you work out for up to a five seconds. Try to get yourself up to a 60 second break. Um, a 60 second duration, sorry. Okay, and then exercise number two, we're gonna go with a double knee raise. So when you're lying on your back, try to keep your hips and knees at a 90 degree position. Sorry, I'm just gonna switch over because I got sun in my eyes. You're gonna be lying on your back, hips and knees at a 90 degree position. Start with your abs brace at that two out of 10. Okay, and slowly lower just until your thighs are at that 45 degree position and back up. You don't wanna to go too too much, you don't want to go too low because what can happen is you can again put stress on your low back. And if you feel your low back working here, you're dropping your thighs to a low position where you don't need to be. So start with a 30 degree range of motion and you should be able to sustain that brace throughout the whole range. And if not, that typically means you're dropping your thighs to a level where it's a little bit lower than they should be. Okay, so start with about 10 reps of those. Make sure it feels comfortable for your low back before you proceed and try, try to work up to a set of 15. Okay, and in the circuit today of the six exercises, keep it to two sets of each one, nice and simple, 10, 15 reps, 30 second to 60 second for a plank, and that's more than enough for all you'll need. Okay, and in our four point thoracic position for exercise number three, abs braced again to about a five out of 10, I would say looking down between your thumbs you're going to put one hand behind your head and as you rotate in bring your left elbow to touch your right elbow and opening up your upper spine as much as you can as you rotate through okay so you're trying to get the movement out of your upper spine and not your lower back okay so if you take a line from your middle of your spine you don't want much moving between your tailbone and your mid spine we want to be getting that motion and mobility from the mid back to upper there. Okay, so hand behind your head, touch the left elbow to right, and opening up, exhaling every time we open up, and inhaling as we lower. For this one, easy enough to get about 15 aside here before we switch over to the other side. All right, and then our fourth, what I'm gonna show you here on the mat again is your, your fourth one, which is your hip flexor stretch. So exercises and stretches we can do to keep loose and mobile um, and prevent you from being in any harmful positions. So for your hip flexor stretch, right foot straight in front of your right hip, left knee, it's gonna be straight below your left hip and try to slightly lean in. If you can tilt your pelvis inward, okay? So think of it as rotating up and you're trying to lengthen out that hip flexor, keep looking straight. And we're gonna hold that for about 30 seconds all right, before you switch over to the other side. For exercise number five, we're gonna be doing again a stretch, which is a chest stretch. I'm gonna bring you over here. So when your hips and knees, you want your, if you're stretching our left side here, we want our left foot forward, stepping right through, left elbow at a 90 degree angle. And we're gonna place that on the edge of a wall with that left foot through. To get an increased stretch, you can push that left hip out forward and over to our right hand side to increase that stretch on in our left side okay same thing you can switch over angles to your right side step with your right foot through and you're going to shoot over the other way all right and that's stretch number five for number six here what we're going to try to do is a wall slide now out here i don't have a flat wall but ideally you're working with a flat straight wall you can have your whole back against 
So you would place your shoulder blades against the wall. Your heels would be against that flat wall also. Your markers are gonna be your heels, your hips, your shoulder blades, and your head, all against that wall. We want the upper arms all the way to your wrist and hands, all against that wall. Brace the core to about a two to five out of 10. Have everything against it and try to slide, maintaining the hands against the wall through the whole range. Try to extend the elbows and bringing them right down back into your sides. Keep the core braced throughout the whole range. Okay, so we're gonna try to go up and down for 10. And as you progress through these exercises, hopefully we can get to 15. Okay, so two sets of 15 of these as well in the six exercise and stretch rotation. All right, so that's all for today from me. Um, thanks for watching. Again, I'm Ramela Rodriguez from the Lateral Health Network. So those were really good techniques that you can use. Um, one of my favorites is plank and a good way to increase your core strength, which has a huge impact on, on your systemic muscle system is plank. And you can do that anywhere. But all those are very, very helpful and beneficial. And so I think you can uh, definitely try and give them a go. But in addition to those stretches, there are things that you can do while you're sitting at the chair. And here are some examples that um, I posed out here for you to take a look at and try. And if you have not tried these, you should. They are simple, quick, easy, and they will do you wonders. Um, the first one, the unitwister. Um, you're basically taking your hand and your arm and you're going up and over, and this will stretch the side abdominal muscles, and then you'll get a little bit of some stretch here in your neck. The neck and shoulder combination, which is really, really good um, because it, targets those muscles that get fatigued a lot. You're basically, you know, taking cross arm and you're turning your head. So you're getting a stretch here and then a stretch here on your neck and that upper tra trapezius muscle. So you're kind of going like that. The upper trapezius, which, you know, you hit on with the uh, previous slide, um, this one's specific to it. You Basic. And if you need to pull away from the patient for a couple minutes, because I can guarantee you their jaws are getting tired. And so they would probably like a break too. So put your hand piece down, scoot your chair back and do some of these stretches. Super easy, super quick. So you put your hand down on your uh, thigh, you put your other hand behind your wrist and you just pull and you can kind of twist a little bit. You will feel it in this upper trap and up in this area. It does wonders. And then another one of my favorites is the downward squeeze. So you can go to a high to low position. So you go high and you go low and then you also pull back. And that gets that uh, huge muscle group in the back, the trap lats, et cetera. And you'll feel it and it feels good. Even if it's something that you hold for five seconds is better than nothing. Ideally, 15 to 20 seconds, do it maybe one or two times and then jump right back in. And I think your patient will appreciate that little break too. Other MSD treatment considerations include, um, well, if, if you suspect that you're having some early signs or you are having some early signs, rest. You know, make sure you're getting enough sleep. Make sure you are uh, taking breaks in between patients or during procedures ice um, to reduce some of the inflammation, anti-inflammatories, you can have splints and braces uh, to help support those muscle groups. Sometimes it takes a while to build the strength up in those muscles like they should be. And so braces and splints will, will help until you can do that. Um, regular massage appointments. After the bout that I had with my neck, I had gone to the chiropractor, then I went to the massage therapist, and then I got to thinking, you know, I should probably just keep doing this because it feels good. Who doesn't like a massage, right? And it is something that I really benefit from. And I've been doing it uh, for quite a while now. I go to the massage uh, therapist probably every two to three weeks and it has done wonders. Another thing that uh, you can have done is dry needling. 
um, which kind of resets those uh, balled up muscles. Or if you have a knot, the dry needling basically takes muscles that are, or the muscle fibers that are all just conglomerated and it resets them so that those fibers can realign uh, and then you don't get that tension. Uh, posture assessments with the physical therapist. Um, have, have a physical therapist come into your office and say, these are some areas that I'm really, really struggling in, in my head and neck. This is my chair. This is my workstation. What do you suggest to improve this status quo? And also neuromuscular specialists. You know, if you are uh, advancing in your MSD severity, uh, neuromuscular specialists can also play an important role in getting the therapy that you need. Um, and again, work on strengthening your core and your stabilization muscles, just as uh, we depicted in the slide um, with uh, the exercises and stretches a few slides ago. So we briefly touched on this earlier, but let's kind of get down to some of the specifics. So room setup, equipment choices, and application. There are all kinds of dental practice design and room setups out there. There are some that are really, really good, and there are some that are really, really not good. Um, first of all, your dental patients' um, chairs. Um, one, they, they need to be comfortable. They should be comfortable for your patient because they're put in an awkward position too. Um, but there also has to be some kind of ergonomic capacity to them. And so most of the chairs designed nowadays are very thin so that you can get up underneath them. Um, your delivery systems. Um, do you have a side delivery? which usually it's tucked under, up underneath a cabinet, or do you have a chair delivery system that swivels off of the base of the chair? Both systems have their pros and cons. Um, sometimes the space that you have doesn't allow for one system over the other. Uh, sometimes doctors just have preferences from one or the other. And so you have to analyze specifically what you might do more of if you're an endodontist, a surgeon, or uh, just a general dentist. Um, you know, those are some things that you have to put in that consideration of the type of delivery system that's best. Uh, another thing that we don't really think about is our lighting systems. Um, the, the efficiency of our lights, are they bright enough? Is the room light? Uh, bright enough. If it's not bright enough, then we're having a hard time seeing. And if we're having a hard time seeing, we have a tendency to hunch over more. Um, sometimes the positioning of the light and how we have to stretch and move the light to get it to where it needs to go has an impact, um, whether it's off the chair or um, on the uh, wall or ceiling mount. So, you know, all those things have, a, have an impact on uh, overall ergonomics and, and you don't really think about that but so you know check your light bulbs and check the uh, efficiency of the the lighting and the, the lumens and the output. touch on this a little bit before but uh, one of the biggest things are doctor's chairs you know if you have a chair that has the capacity to have posterior lumbar support but you're not using it as it should be then you're using the chair wrong and so ideally, again, you should have your uh, hips kind of tucked out to maintain the S curve. And it's really hard with chairs that in, in my personal experience um, with the, so on the top picture on the left-hand side with the operator, she's sitting in the green chair. That's a really hard position for me to maintain. I don't feel comfortable in that. What I use is called a saddle chair and that's the, the upper right hand picture. The reason that I like the saddle chair is because it automatically, when I sit in it, my spine is already automatically aligned. These also come with back support. You can also get them with armrest support. Um, but since I started using a saddle chair, probably, I probably started using one 12, 13 years ago. I really have had zero issues with lower back pain none because I'm using the muscles as they should be used and I'm automatically put in position that aligns me like I should be aligned. But then you also have to think of your assistance chairs too. They get put in awkward positions because they're trying to lean over. They're trying to get their mirrors and their suctions where they need to be. And so do they have proper armrests? Um, they might want to try the saddle chair uh, 
just out as well. So give them the opportunity to maximize their ergonomics as well. And we'll go into that a little bit more. Another thing that uh, can have an impact with uh, ergonomics is the cabinets and your storage and your access to supplies. If you're having to twist and reach because you don't have drawers or cabinets where they should be for the supplies that you use commonly, um, again, you're, you're moving and having excessive movement that can you know, repetitively cumulatively have an impact on your MSD potential. Another thing are instrument considerations and their application. Um, the weight and size, the heavier the instruments, the more muscle tension that we have to apply to hold them. Um, smaller instruments are harder to hold on to because we have to pinch harder um, than the larger instruments. Um, the, the large hollow instruments also have a high uh, dexterity capacity and um, we're able to feel uh, what we're doing, um, you know, for hygienists, their explorers, um, all those types of things, uh, you know, a solid versus a hollow instrument is, is very uh, beneficial. Um, well, the, the larger uh, hollow instruments are more beneficial than, than the solid because you, you can feel things better. Um, maintenance, you know, how sharp are your instruments? Um, if you're having, you know, for a hygienist and um, if their scaling instruments aren't sharp, they're having to put more force into what they're doing. And so they're more prone to fatigue. And let's not forget our instruments. Um, and that's, that can be cumulative over a period of time as well. Cord types with our hand pieces. Um, some, some cords come on springs. And so if those springs are really stiff, we're having to pull and hold those uh, air water syringes, suction tips, hand pieces, and that can give some fatigue. And then another thing that we might not think about are our gloves, you know, the different types of gloves and the surface textures. And, you know, if something feels slippery, we've got to really grip onto it versus any kind of surface texture that allows us a more relaxed uh, holding onto with our instruments. And everything has an impact on positioning and applied effort. Another thing, uh, and this kind of goes back to, you know, block scheduling too uh, with production, but uh, appointment considerations, uh, the types of appointments that you have, um, are they all restorative? You know, six hours of restorative appointments is a lot. Um, the duration of the appointments, if you have uh, a straight through hour appointment versus a few short appointments, uh, you know, crown seats or, you know, things that get you moving around a little bit versus an appointment that's three or four hours long for some of those construction cases, those can have a huge impact too. And, and your variability, uh, production, those are all things that, that go into the appointment considerations that you have. Let's not forget about our staff and our clinical um, help because they are a huge role in what we do. I know for me personally, um, if my staff are not working up to their potential, then I can't work up to my potential either. Um, and each of, of your staff are predisposed to pain and injury, just like we are, uh, depending on his or her tasks and if they're with a patient or without or not with a patient. Um, seizing of muscles, misalignment of bones, achiness, joints, arthritis, et cetera. You know, our front desk receptionists, they're tapping away on the computer all the time. They're holding the phone like this. And, you know, those are things that they have to deal with. They're, they're different than what we are dealing with um, as far as task goes, but the repetition and the improper applied positioning is uh, something that can set them up for MSDs as well. Um, so take time and invest in proper equipment for them. Computers, chairs, desks, materials, so that they can be at their optimal performance. Um, if your front desk uh, personnel are having back issues, spend the 150, 200 bucks to get them a good chair so that they're comfortable. Because if they're not in pain, then they're not going to be focused on their back. They're going to be focused at, on what their task is at hand. Um, and then you can educate them, send them to CE courses that include. Uh, 
you know, classes on ergonomic principles, um, have the physical therapist come and talk to them about proper ergonomics. And then also always, always emphasize health and wellness. And I really appreciate this quote by Richard Watson. Uh, because it's something that can be applied in dentistry. He says, take care of your employees and they'll take care of your business. And it's so true. If you are taking care of your staff and if they are healthy and happy, they're going to be more motivated and go above and beyond what their tasks are because they know that you care for them. They're not in pain and they're going to want to do more and be more than, than otherwise. I put this slide in here because I think it drives home the point of how the body can heal itself. So this is my dad, he's 70, and he was almost completely disabled from a rheumatoid arthritis bout. And RA is something that as dentists, we are also prone to, um, you know, arthritis in the joints and, and other things. And so, uh, he was literally, he couldn't even pick up a ball. So he started modifying things. It takes longer when you are older. If you have MSDs, these things can be corrected, but it does take longer, but it takes discipline and diligence. And so he went from being almost completely disabled to climbing mountains to 10,000 feet with me. It's possible. And I think that's a pretty amazing thing to be able to do. Um, and so if you are having challenges with MSDs or uh, have doubts or questions on whether or not you can change the way you're working, it's possible. Start simple and build from there. Last but not least, this is a, a quote of mine that I, I, I tend to gravitate toward a lot of uh, wellness things, but this really drives home the point. And if you think about it, and, and if you dissect what this says uh, accordingly, it will hopefully have an impact on you like it has on me. It says, before you know it, you will be at the latter part of your life and you will reflect on the course it's taken. Don't be filled with thoughts of, I wish I could have, should have, or would have. Do that stuff now. Have zero regrets and make each and every day count as if it were your last, because all of a sudden it will be. Don't be in the middle to latter part of your career and then think, okay, now I have to deal with this and this is what my life is going to entail. Work on those things now. Things can be changed. If you are early in your dental career, assess what's going on and then fix it. Um, don't have any kind of regrets. Do things now so that you can have a positive impact on your life later on. And so with that being said, here's a list of my references. And if you have any questions or thoughts or considerations that uh, you want to shoot my way, my contact information is given in the webinar uh, bio and specifics. And I hope you're able to glean some good information from this uh, webinar. I really enjoyed doing it. I, again, I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, until then, I hope you guys are having a great day. Thank you, Dr. Jividen, for your time this evening. As a thank you for attending, everyone will receive the recording via email sometime in the next week. If there are any outstanding questions, please feel free to email us at webinars at henryshine.com. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great night.